Hello, Jacksonites, and welcome to a brand new review on a movie that I have been waiting so long to review. I have no idea why I've been waiting so long. Better late than never, I suppose. But seriously, why the hell did it take me this long to talk about this? Well, I don't really have an answer for that, but I have an explanation as to why I'm doing this video now. A couple, actually. Today, I will be discussing, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies, not just horror movies, but movies in general ever made, ironically from a director that I do not like. And that is, of course, John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982. And of course, joining me today is fellow reviewer Trevor Thompson. Make yourself known. Howdy, everybody. We're in for a treat today. I think this will be the first review where me and Nick are pretty much on the same page. And it wouldn't be a true Jacksonites uh, Productions review if I didn't have the good old Burt Fuel. Sam's Cola Zero. I work at Walmart. I'm not a sellout. <laughs> so, yes, John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, boy. Okay, so I've made it no secret on my channel that I am not a fan of John Carpenter. Uh, I don't think he's that good of a film director. I think he's one of the most overrated film directors. And arguably his most famous film, Halloween, is one of only four movies that I've ever reviewed on my channel that I've given a zero out of ten to. And every other movie that I've seen has ranged from either okay to bleh. Um, I've seen They Live. There's elements of that that I kind of like, but I ultimately think it's just massive style over substance type stuff. Uh. Christine is a decent movie, but it's not a good adaptation of Stephen King's book. Ghosts of Mars is pretty much a Doom movie without being a Doom movie. Vampires, I thought, was generic as fuck with a generic-ass title. And there's one other movie that I've seen. Oh, and The Fog. Eh, I, I didn't dig it. I'm just not a fan of John Carpenter. Um, I, I kind of feel like he might be like an old eight, ironically, because he's friends with this guy. He's like a 70s and 80s version of Rob Zombie. There's a lot of things that Rob Zombie does right, and there's a lot of things he does wrong. Now, I don't know about Trev. What do you think of John Carpenter? Well, I'm going to have to say that I'm the good cop in this situation because I have liked or even loved most of what I've seen from John. I haven't really bothered with his later stuff, like starting in the 90s and on, although I do want to see in the in the Mouth of Madness. I think I got the title right. Uh, Which was the first, yeah, inst I, I know, th I think this was the first installment of John Carpenter's Apocalypse Trilogy and then came in the Mouth of Madness. Yes, yes. Um, actually, no, uh, the thing is considered part, it, it, yeah, well, you said that, never mind. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, I really dig most of Carpenter's output. I have heard uh, that John Carpenter just kind of went off the deep end in the 90s or so, well, and a lot of his movies that he put out during that time were just kind of bad. Well, he got sick of the studios and them interfering with what he was trying to do, so at some point he just said fuck it and, you know, just made subpar material. Hmm. Continue. At least that's the story going around out there. Continue. Oh, but no, uh, you're not going to like 
purpose, but I think along with uh, Halloween and the Fog, in my opinion, that those are probably his three favorite movies of mine. And after that, I find the others uh, that I've seen, which is pretty much his output through the 80s, uh, enjoyable. Mm. So, yeah, it looks like I'm the bad cop in this situation. Yeah, I'm... Sorry, man. I just don't. I don't dig John Carpenter. I respect the man because of his passion for film, and I will give him credit that he is a very good music composer. I will give him all the credit in the world for that. Um, though I'm glad he didn't score this movie because I just don't think it, it would have worked nearly as well if he scored this movie. He would have tried, but Ennio Morricone's theme for this movie is just too iconic to replace it with anything else. It's like. It's like Godzilla cannot be scored. Classic Godzilla cannot be scored by anyone other than Akira Fukube. Um. So yeah, I'm just I don't dig John Carpenter, but damn, I'll I'll eat my words and say that John Carpenter made my all time favorite horror movie. Because yeah, The Thing is my all time favorite horror movie. I think I've said that before, but I'm just going to reiterate it here. Um, I think this is the greatest horror movie ever made on both a technical scale and also an objective scale and also a personal scale. I think it's one of the greatest movies of all time. Certainly. Okay. I am not going to call this a remake. I'm not. I am aware. Trevor is as well. Uh... Of. The original 1951, The Thing from Another World. I considered reviewing that for this series, but ultimately I decided not to because A, I don't really want to. B, I'm not a huge fan of that film. And also C, it's really not that good of an adaptation of the original story. I'll get to that in just a minute. But I'm not going to call this a remake. Though... I guess you could say if you wanted to, this is easily one of the top five greatest remakes ever made. Now, I said story. The Thing is an adaptation of a 1938 short novella titled Who Goes There, written by John W. Campbell Jr. Now, before we did this review, me and Trev, I had Trev listen to it. Uh, we both listened to the original short story. Uh, it is on YouTube in 12 parts. It's maybe like two and a half hours long. So it's a pretty easy sit. Um, I do want to briefly talk about uh, the short story. Trev, what do you think of the short story? I actually really liked it. And uh, who, who was the person narrating it, the one they have on YouTube? Edward E. French. Yeah, I really liked uh, He had a Vincent Price vibe going on. I think whenever I get a chance, I'm going to download all these parts and uh, put them in a file on my laptop so I can listen to it whenever. I get it, was, it. it was a good listen. Uh, it's a lot like the, the movie. He took lots of inspiration from it. But, of course, it is different because it's, uh, it's set in the 30s too, isn't it? I believe so. It, it, it is very 1930s. We're not going to talk about the comparisons and differences at least, at least not till later. But um, I also have, of course, read the story or listened to the story. I should say um, it is very good. I feel like it's a little bit ahead of ahead of its time because while it is very nineteen thirties, because there's no year given, you could kind of say this could take place in any decade that you want, relatively. Um, but I do feel it's a little bit ahead of its time, while at the still at the same time being very 1930s. Um, it's good. It's enjoyable. It's tense. Um, it's riveting. It's entertaining. My only issue with it is that why is it a short story? But there's actually a little bit of kind of recently unknown information. So in 2018, I give Acid Glow some credit for for giving me uh, the YouTuber acid glow um, giving me this information. It's been revealed that in 2018, it was discovered that who goes there 
is not the actual title and is not the complete form of the original story. The actual title of the story is called Frozen Hell. And also in 2018, there was a Kickstarter campaign started to somehow get the full story released. Now, I don't know if it was either unsuccessful or if it's just not complete yet. However, if the fact that there is another thing project on the way that is taking full inspiration from the full Frozen Hell story, maybe it has been completed and they're just waiting to release it for later reasons. I'm not sure. But um, maybe it's kind of like a Phantasm type thing where you know you listen to it and it's good, but there's something feels missing. That explains why. It's because it's not the complete story. Now, it doesn't like have Phantasm Syndrome where it feels like an incomplete film. It still naturally flows along as a cohesive story. But now that I know this information, it definitely does feel incomplete. And I think I might have just burst Trevor's bubble, too. Oh, no. I actually heard that they were going to factor some of this new information into the next movie they're going to try. I'm excited for it because apparently Carpenter is involved and it's still a Universal slash Blumhouse production. So I'm good. I'm game. Just don't make it like the 2019 Black Christmas, please. Yeah, they have a pretty good track record overall. And I'm really hoping they really do something new with the concept while still being familiar, which is always a hard thing to find, but, you know, they should try it. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, uh, yes, the 82 thing is a, a, I'm going to call it a re-adaptation, not a remake. It's a re-adaptation of the original story. I'm not calling it a remake of the 1951 The Thing, um, partially because, A, the films are so different, both content-wise and also quality wise and story wise i would venture to say that 82 thing is maybe a 85 to 90 percent adaptation of the original short story there's just minor things that are changed around some numbers are reduced the ending is a little bit different and a couple scenes are shuffled around to uh fit the, the story of the film a lot better than in the book but for the most part, this is a very good adaptation of the original short story. And I give Carpenter all the credit in the world. Um, and also the writers, of course. But yeah, Carpenter managed to pull off a good movie in my eyes. So, it's oh, and Shawnee really, Boy is here. Also, sorry. Go ahead. It's also important to know, and you may, you may or may not know this, Nick, but uh, Carpenter is a fan of the original 50s movie. He grew up on it. I do. And it does it does pop up on the TV in the original Halloween. Anybody out there who's trying to say that Carpenter was dropping hints for his future project, I don't believe that. I think that was just a coincidence. Uh, he was, yeah, he was just re he was making a reference to a movie that he loved. And also Shawnee Boy is here. All right. Alrighty, so let's get into the plot of John Carpenter's The Thing. In Antarctica, a Norwegian helicopter pursues a sled dog to an American research station. I always wonder, what the fuck are these guys doing down here? Uh, I guess doing research on Antarctica. <laughs> That's actually one of my minor nitpicks with this movie, is that what the fuck are these guys doing down here? Whatever. The Americans witness the Norwegian passenger accidentally blow up the hot helicopter and himself. The Norwegian pilot fires a rifle and shouts at the Americans, but they cannot understand him. And he is shot dead in self-defense by Station Commander Gary, played by Donald Moffat. Conveniently, they have the actor and role list right next to the plot. The American helicopter pilot, R.J. McCready, played, of course, by Kurt Russell. And Dr. Copper, played by Richard Dysart, leave to investigate the Norwegian base. 
Among the charred ruins and frozen corpses, which, fun fact, was actually the, the American station just repurposed and reshot um, at the very end of the shoot for this film. They just made it to, and they just said, hey, this is a Norwegian base, but it's actually the American base. Um, they find the burned remains of a severely malformed humanoid, which they recover to the American station, looking like something out of the Hellraiser series. Their biologist Blair, played by the recently deceased A. Wilford Brimley, and at this point he was still not worried about dying from diabetes, <laughs> performs autopsies on the remains and finds a normal set of human organs. Diabetes. Clark kennels the sled dog, and he does not uh, diagnose the body with diabetes. Clark kennels the sled dog, Clark being played by Richard Mosser, and it soon metamorphoses and absorbs the station dogs by quad splitting its face apart and growing bug legs and tentacles. This disturbance alerts the team and Childs uses a flamethrower to incinerate the creature. Childs being played by the great Keith David, which I didn't realize that till a couple of years ago. But then I was like, oh, duh, of course this is Keith David. Uh, who the hell else has that voice? Yep, yep. Blair autopsies the new creature and learns that it can perfectly imitate other organisms, which I have to say, Wilford Brimley does a great job of showing disgust, which is ironic because um, he was 100% used to seeing nasty-ass uh, animal organs because he was a rancher and cowboy, so he was used to seeing animal organs. But whatever. Uh, so yeah, Blair conducts autopsies on this new creature and, and learns that it's an organism that can imitate other life forms and imitate them perfectly. And recovered Norwegian data leads the Americans to a large excavation site containing a partially buried alien spacecraft <coughs> Which has led some people to think that this is maybe a sequel to the 1951 original film. I don't believe that at all. And also, if you take into the account the 2011 prequel, this completely uh, uh, debunks that theory. The 51 movie also takes place at the North Pole and not Antarctica. That too. So yeah, they, they find this partially buried spacecraft in a smaller human-sized dig site. Norris estimates that the alien ship, Norris being played by Charles Hallahan, he estimates that the ship has been buried for at least 100,000 years. Blair grows more and more paranoid that the creature could assimilate all life on Earth in a matter of years. Specifically, 27,000 hours, which is about 3.082 years. Actually, not about. That's exactly how much it is. The station implements controls to reduce the risk of assimilation. The quote-unquote dead, malformed humanoid Hellraiser-looking creature assimilates and isolated Bennings. However, Win Windows interrupts the process and McCready burns the Bennings thing to death. Not long after this, though, Blair sabotages all the vehicles, kills the remaining sled dogs, destroys the radio, and all while this, this ranting and raving like a madman due to him suffering a mental breakdown. Which I kind of can't help but snicker because some of the lines that he says in his crazy, angry, old man voice kind of cracks me up. I'll kill you! <laughs> um, Blair fears I'll kill um, anybody interferes, I'll kill him. <laughs> uh, let's see. The team imprisons him in a tool shed, and Copper suggests a blood serum test to compare each member's blood against uncontaminated blood held in storage. But after learning that the blood stores have been destroyed, we'll talk about this later, the men lose faith in Gary, and McCready takes command. McCready, Windows, and Nalls find Fuchs's burnt corpse and surmise he committed suicide to avoid assimilation. I don't think this is the case, and we'll talk about this later as well. 
Windows returns to the base while McCready and Nalls investigate McCready's shack. And on their return, Nalls abandons McCready in a snowstorm, believing he has been assimilated after finding his torn clothes in the shack. The team debate whether to allow McCready inside, but he breaks in and holds the group at bay with dynamite. And during this encounter, Norris appears to suffer a heart attack. As Copper attempts to revitalize, to revive and defibrillate Norris, his chest transforms into a large mouth and sadly kills off Dr. Copper. McCready incinerates the Norris thing, but its head detaches and attempts to escape before also being burnt. You gotta be fucking kidding. McCready is forced to kill Clark in self-defense when he lunges at McCready from behind with a scalpel. He hypothesizes that the Norris thing's head demonstrated that every part of the thing is an individual life form with its own survival instinct. He sequentially tests blood samples with a heated piece of wire. Everybody passes the test except Palmer, whose blood jumps from the heat. Exposed, Palmer Thing transforms, infects and kills Windows, which forces McCready to burn them both. And to quote Deus Deacon Reviews, proves who the winner in the uh, computer test or computer race has been since the beginning of computers. Who is the winner, Mac or Windows? And the winner is ultimately Mac. <laughs> Childs is left on guard while the others go to test Blair. They find that the assimilated Blair has escaped, and during all this time that this shit's been going on, has been using vehicle components to assemble a small spacecraft. Well, this is a scene that was inspired by the ending of the original short story, where the people kill the Blair thing, and they discover that the Blair thing was dangerously close to completing an atomically powered anti-gravity device so that it could escape Antarctica and go anywhere but there. But this was um, moved just before the ending so that we could give way to this movie's epic and ambiguous ending. So let's see. On their return, Childs is missing and the power generator is destroyed. McCready speculates that the thing intends to return into hibernation until the rescue team arrives to find it, so that this shit can start all over again. McCready, Gary, and Nalls decide to detonate the entire station to destroy the thing, and as they set explosives, Blair Thing kills Gary and Nalls disappears. There was a deleted scene. I haven't seen it, but apparently there was a scene that Carpenter not decided not to go with of the transformed Blair thing killing Nalls. But he said that the stop motion animation that was used to convey the Blair thing looked too ridiculous. Kind of think he should have just stuck with it and let this let the movie carry on because as the movie currently stands, Nalls walks away and he's never seen again. Hi, honey. Blair transforms into an enormous creature and destroys the detonator. However, McCready triggers the explosives using a stick of dynamite, uttering a famous Kurt Russell quote, Yeah, fuck you too, and destroys the base. McCready sits nearby as the station burns, and Childs returns, saying he became lost in the storm while pursuing Blair. Exhausted and slowly freezing to death, they acknowledge the futility of their distrust and share a bottle of scotch. Ambiguous ending of ambiguous endings commenced. Thus ending the film. Trev, go ahead. That is an excellent plot. I also want to point out uh, the Norwegian with the rifle who tries to communicate with the guys there at the beginning is played by Larry Franco, who was John Carpenter's producing partner for a little while. Huh. Just a fun little fact. Did not know that. So what do I think? Uh, so, what do I think ahead. of this plot? 
Um, it's the antithesis of an alien invasion story, uh, for starters. The story feels very isolated, both literally and figuratively, but it also feels big in scope at the same time. Um, this story could not take place in anywhere else other than Antarctica, which I think it's a big problem for setting the original at the, the North Pole rather than the South, but that's just me. Part of my wife, she just went to the bathroom. Um, I love this story. Um, it's the antithesis of an alien invasion. It's well thought out. Um, it's well executed. And overall, it's just a a masterfully tons told story and um, can't give enough praise. It's actually the step before trying to prevent the invasion. That too. So Trev, you tell me you have 10 pros. Lay them on me. Oh, do, you, do we want to do the personal histories or? Oh yeah, sure. Go right ahead. Yeah, so back in the day, back around when I was about 9 or 10 years old, I used to uh, go on a site called Monsters in Motion, which had a whole bunch of model kits and uh, collectibles for horror and sci-fi movies. And because the only movies I was allowed to watch uh, within that genre were the Universal movies, uh, these model kits and whatnot were pretty much my only window into these other more quote-unquote contemporary kinds of movies so i took note of uh todd mcfarland's movie maniacs figures and there were about three uh i guess you might say they're iconic or uh very memorable in the collecting community uh figures from the thing there were two of the norris thing one with the spider head and one with the one that comes out of uh, norris's chest and there was one for the blair monster which is the one that i eventually got and sadly, I got rid of that later on, which is one of my regrets, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that was my first exposure to this this movie called The Thing. And these, these creatures just captured my imagination. And then a couple years later, in 2002, uh, it was the 20th anniversary. And that's also with the video game, which is also Correct. one of the few sequel ideas to The Thing. Was it's the only one that's canon. Was so they were showing the movie. And I saw a little bit a little bit of it on there. And of course on the sci-fi channel it's edited somewhat. So eventually my dad picked up a DVD from Best Buy. Uh, it was the collector's edition. I think it was released in 1998. And it was pretty much the only DVD for a while. But anyway, uh, we went to go watch it. And I'll never forget the fact that my dad, because he probably didn't want me to snitch out to my mom, not that I was going to anyway. Uh, he told me before the dog thing uh, scene, the kennel scene, uh, he made it very clear. He, he couldn't stress enough that what I was about to see was not real at all and that I didn't need to be afraid of it. And, of course, <laughs> I wasn't. I was I was completely amazed by it. And I was like I was hooked from that point on. And uh, I eventually became uh, the thing guy at my elementary school because I was talking about this movie for a long time. Next to Tremors, it was probably one of my obsessions for a little while. That's cool. Yeah. Um, keep going. No, that's about it, other than the fact that I've seen it several times since, although before this uh, recent rewatch, it's been a while, so I'm actually kind of glad because it reminded me how good the movie was. Well, my personal history with the thing is uh, <clears throat> I first heard of this film through James Rolfe back in 2008 or 9, maybe 8. He did a three-part retrospective series on reviewing various alien invasion films and their remakes. Um... And one of them, of course, was John Carpenter's The Thing. And he talked about the, the 51 version and the 82 version. And both movies really stuck out to me as looking like movies that I would probably like. 
And I was always intrigued, but it took me a while to get around to seeing the films. I actually remember it was maybe a year or two later when I decided to watch John Carpenter's The Thing on YouTube. Remember back in the day when you were you could watch movies on YouTube, but just in multiple parts, like they would chop the video up in 10, 10 minute videos or so until it was finished. Oh, yeah, those were the days. Yeah, that, that's how I watched the the John Carpenter's The Thing. And funny enough, I only remember it because this is going to sound really fucking stupid. I only remember it because I got it in my head for some fucking reason to shave my legs that night. I don't know why. And I cut the dog shit out of myself. (laughs) Were you experimenting there, Nick? I don't know. I was a dumb kid. But aside from that, I also remember watching The Thing for the first time because I actually remember not really digging it the first time I saw it. I I liked parts of it, but I also thought there were other moments where the movie, I was like, God, this is dragging so bad. Move on already. So, yeah, I actually was not a big fan of this movie when I first saw it. Um, But obviously, upon subsequent rewatchings, the movie just kept growing and growing and growing and growing on me. Uh, To the point where, I'm going to say this again, this is my all-time favorite horror film and one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, And I'll never forget, arguably my most fondest memory of watching this uh, movie. Now, I have seen this with my wife, and unfortunately, she's a hater. But mm, about two years ago or so, I had my brother over, and he and I decided to watch the thing. Now, the movie is only an hour and 48 minutes long. Perfect runtime, by the way. It took us three hours to watch the entire movie because we kept pausing it to have conversations about, um, you know, parts of the thing, like when did Norris become a thing or when did Palmer become a thing or what kind of special effects would we use if this movie was to be made nowadays? And we both came to the conclusion that we would use both practical and CGI effects. Um, And it was one of the most fun movie experiences I've ever had with somebody other than myself. Um, I love this movie. I I can't stress how much I love this movie. And uh, this was actually the first time that I'd seen this movie since watching it with my wife, who didn't give a shit about it. Um, That's all I have to say. Um, Fantastic film. You got 10 cons, let's hear them. Or 10 pros, let's hear them. All righty. So I'm probably going to say the first two together because they kind of work in tandem together. Uh, Number one is the atmosphere, and number two is the music. From the very get-go, whenever we have the odd, but I still like it, uh, credit sequence before the actual title is revealed, uh, the music just starts to smell and, and build, and it sounds very, very ominous. And it, it just continues to go from there once uh, we see the title card and, and, and also the... The awesome you know, title card. Yeah, and the, and the winter, uh, An- Antarctica, winter 1982, and then we hear the boom, boom. And uh, yeah, it just goes from there. There's this movie is dripping with atmosphere, and the music accentuates it at several points. There's several moments that just give me chills. Uh, you know, like the music whenever they're flying over the Norwegian camp and they're about to land is very chilling. Or even whenever they find uh, the ice, the ice bed, which is a reference to the Fifty One movie. It yes. doesn't mean that it's a sequel. I don't know why some people would think that it is a reference to it, though. And, um, yeah, or, or the music whenever they bring 
bring the split face thing back and they're looking over and they're just trying to figure out what the fuck is this thing and there's this this final shot where uh the music does this it almost sounds a little like jaws uh, and it shows mccready's reaction and then it pans down to the floor and shows the dog thing looking looking in on the situation and probably realizing oh i'm probably gonna need to do something real quick because mm-hmm. these guys are gonna start realizing that something's uh, up that dog is one of the best actors in this entire movie and I think they went into it on the commentary, which you know what? I'm actually probably going to watch the movie again with the commentary tonight because <laughs> it's a real, it's a really fun commentary. Uh, it's with I Carpenter and Kurt Russell, Russell, right? Say that again. It's with Carpenter and Kurt Russell, right? Yeah, and it, it's great because you can tell that Kurt Russell hadn't seen the movie probably since around the time it came out, so he was having all these great, genuine reactions to everything. Yeah, he sounds like a real fun guy to watch a movie with. I'll just say that. Mm. Uh, but they, they do go into, I think, what they had to do to get the dog to uh, act that way. Or John does, I do believe. So, yeah, the atmosphere and the music, uh, they work perfectly together. Without them, this movie would probably be lesser for it. Nah, just be kind of like a generic alien monster on the loose type movie without the atmosphere and music. And this movie is very similar to Alien. I would say that Alien is actually the movie that comes closest to being the same to it, but I say that the thing is probably a tad superior. Maybe Uh, uh, only in the sense where it's a group of people in an isolated location going up against an alien monster. But true, and actually, go ahead. I would like this is well, no, no. Alien is a haunted house movie in space, whereas the thing is, I wouldn't say it's oh, wait, no, I know what it, it's kind of like it's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Uh, there is that a little bit. I, I would definitely say that uh, the original Alien, though, since they're actually from around the same t- time period. Well, yeah, three not, years difference. Yeah, they're pretty much a perfect double feature. That would be my personal recommendation for people is this and the original Alien movie. But, I, I can uh, see that, moving yeah. Moving right along. Uh, were you going to say something, Nick? Nope. Just move right along. Moving right along, uh, the cast and characters. I think everybody in this movie is perfectly cast. Mm-hmm. And I think something interesting about every single one of the characters. And it, it works to the effect that, uh, I mean, if they weren't any good, it would hurt the suspense and the investment in the situation that is occurring for these gentlemen. Uh but, you know, like Kurt Russell as R.J. McCready, you know, speaks for himself. He's the lead of this movie and probably one of the most uh, iconic characters in the sci-fi horror genre. Mm-hmm. At, le- at least for some people. I mean, literally uh, his intro is him frying a piece of electronic equipment that actually did cheat. By just dumping a load of whiskey into its circuitry and just going, cheating bitch. Which, fun fact, that computer was voiced by Adrienne Barbeau, Carpenter's then wife. For those of you who don't know, yes. Adrienne Barbeau. Yes. Go ahead, Trev. No, no, you're, you're, t- you're saying it. Go ahead. Adrienne Barbeau was Carpenter's post Halloween relationship. I don't know how long they were married, but they were married for uh, a few years. And also at the time, I would definitely call a- Adrian Barbeau kind of the Scarlett Johansson of the 80s because Adrian Barbeau was a massive sex symbol at the time. And a lot of people see Scarlett Johansson as a massive sex sex symbol nowadays. I don't see why, but they do. Um, but yeah, well, the computer... I, I definitely... What? I definitely prefer Adrian over Scarlet. That's just me. Adrian is a is a better actor than Scarlet, but yeah, the computer was voiced sure. by Adrian Barbeau, and she's also the 
only female presence in this entire movie. This is one of very few movies that I could think of off the top of my head that, not counting the computer, has a completely all-male cast. Have you ever heard the very outlandish theory that the thing is supposed to be a metaphor for uh, females? No, and I don't buy into it. That's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, those are some uh, some of the more odd ducks in this that, uh, corner. That is, I feel like, is just one of those theories about some butthurt SJWs trying to make a mountain out of a molehill or an anthill. Oh, for sure. I agree. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't even know really where to begin. I, ma- I mentioned McCready, but I think everybody in this movie Cheating bitch. is great. What was that? Cheating bitch. Always cracks me up. Just the way he just casually dumps whiskey into the computer. He just walks away. Cheating bitch. <laughs> yep. It's not like he's ever going to play that again. <laughs> nope. So, uh, yeah, moving right along. Uh, number four is the special effects. Oh, These my God. Probably, probably hands down some of the most iconic effects from the 80s. It, probably the only thing that rivals it, maybe. The fly. Uh the fly, uh, the blob, maybe the transmission from American Werewolf a little bit. Oh, yeah, that too. Uh, but yeah, there's just so many great creatures in this movie, and there's at least one effect which is entirely convincing as real. It's whenever the Norris thing's head uh, splits off and tries to get away. Uh, until it grows legs and everything, it actually looks like uh, the actor's head. Which, fun fact, that was actually a reshoot because Rob Bottin, the man who did the special effects, who I believe also worked on... Was it RoboCop? Yeah, it was RoboCop. He designed the RoboCop suit. They had to redo that scene because all that green and yellow fluid that's splurting out all over the place... Originally, that was made out of highly flammable chemicals, and it caught fire from McCready's flamethrower, and everything just lit up in flames. So they had to redo that scene. Indeed, Rob also did, uh, the year before this, the effects for the howling. And if if you've ever looked up that transformation scene with uh, Eddie Quist, it does look very similar probably to the... uh, the Palmer thing in this movie. Uh, Rob also did uh, the design for uh, Darkness in Legend. And I think one of the last... Don't tell Jackie Boy that, because he loves that movie. Oh, yeah, Jackie Boy, yeah. I I watched his review. I kind of like it myself. Uh, And also, I think one of the last things that Rob was credited with in terms of creature design was the sea monster from uh, Deep Rising. So I don't think he had like a long list of credits, but uh, he's consistently good. Are very memorable. Yes. Um, uh, and Nick, also, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say something about. Oh fuck! What was I gonna say? God damn it! Go ahead. I, I'll try to remember it. You mentioned something about how uh, the fate of Knowles was supposed to feature uh, some of the stop motion Blair monster on the, I don't know if there's been a newer release that features more of that footage, but there is a uh, stop motion footage. There very little. Footage. There's very Same. little stop motion used in this movie. Very, very little. Yeah, but there is a deleted scene, which is on my uh, copy that I watched which uh, shows a little bit more stop motion whenever the Blair thing attacks uh, McCready. It comes out of the floor, and they have a pan-up shot showing it turn around to look at him. And there's also, uh, right before he throws the dynamite at it, it shows the, the blue dog thing in the Blair monster or Blair thing's chest uh, coming down and trying to come after him. So if you've never seen it before, it's pretty cool. I mean... If the endoskeleton in the original Terminator works, I think they could have kept this in there, especially if it also included the fate of Knowles. But, you know, that's me. Mm. I'm um, also a big stop motion guy, so I appreciate seeing any and every instance of it. Um, oh, fuck, there was something I was going to say. 
God damn it. Oh, we got time. It'll probably come back. Um, so moving right along, uh, the suspense in this movie. Oh, my God. Incredible. Yeah, the suspense is incredible. Uh, and it, it's really just a accumulation of, you know, some of the other pros that I've uh, mentioned already, the atmosphere. Well, and not even the music always helps with the suspense because uh, Dick mentioned before recording that uh, – Probably during the majority of the second and third acts of this movie, there's not a whole completely lot of music. silent. I mean, it pops, up, it pops up here and there, uh, but yeah, it's it's very silent in a lot of moments. It's silent before the Norris thing uh, ch- uh, chomps on uh, Copper. Uh, uh, Copper's arms. Yeah, I did not uh, want him to die. I was so disappointed uh, when he died. Yeah, I really like Copper too. Uh, and also, like the blood test scene, it, that scene's completely quiet. And even when all hell breaks loose, it's still just the ambient noises from the room and the and the chaos from it. But yeah, uh, great suspense all the way through uh, to the very last moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, pro, and then moving on to pro number six, uh, we've actually said a few of these already, but there's so many great quotes in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, you know Mac has a whole bunch. Uh, Cheating we, we bitch. Said some of the, yeah, we we said some of the Blair ones. Uh, I mean, I think everybody has at least one quote at some point that is memorable. And if you're like in the thing community or the horror community, even uh, somebody says a line and people immediately recognize it from the thing. What if we're wrong? Well, then we're wrong. <laughs> Then again, like anything that comes out of Keith Wayne's mouth can be iconic because the man just has such a great voice. Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, you think that thing wanted to be an animal? That thing wanted to be us. <laughs> there ain't no way a dog gets a thousand miles in the cold. He's not wrong. It can literally get yeah, that's true. I'm- in 20... 20- 14, I believe, Antarctica reached its record-breaking lowest temperature on the entire planet, surface level, that is, of negative 132 degrees Fahrenheit. That is cold enough to shatter steel. Yep, yep. And dogs are tough, but they're not that tough. No. <laughs> Especially huskies. They have thick fur, but they ain't that, they ain't that powerful. That's true. And really, it makes sense towards the thing's goal uh, that it really wants to uh, imitate and basically conquer the highest form of life on the planet. So it makes sense that they would want to or it would primarily want to, uh, you know, go for the humans. Oh, probably the funniest line in the whole movie. I know you two gentlemen have been through a lot. But if you find the time... I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch. Yeah, I'm glad you said it because I was going to say it and forgot. I love it. Good old Gary. I was bummed when Gary died too. Honestly, who's, uh, who's, uh, are there any characters that you're okay with them going? Windows. Uh, I mean, he, he sucks that he died, but I never was the biggest fan of Windows. I just kind of think he was too much of a pansy. But maybe that was the you point know? to, like, show that he's kind of a coward to, like, yeah. maybe maybe plant a seed of doubt with him becoming a thing. But he, he never does, at least not until after he gets his head bit. Yeah. You know who he reminds me of whenever he's wearing sunglasses? Hmm. It reminds me of Hyde from that 70s show. I, I don't know why, but I've always got that vibe from him. Maybe not like in the way he talks, just the way he looks. Who's also a convicted rapist. So there's that. Yes, yeah, as, as we found out, unfortunately. Um, I only found I that out because it. my wife is a huge fan of that 70s show. And she was like, hey, you remember Hyde from that 70s show? <clears throat> Who is he again? 
the pothead with the sunglasses. Oh, uh huh. He's a rapist. What? Yeah, just one of those, just one of those unfortunate things that's popped up in recent years. <sighs> Fucking Hollywood, uh, man. Anyway, so continue the cast. Or were you talking about the cast? No, I was talking about the quotes. Now. Oh yeah, but the yeah, quotes. It, it just, yeah, it just goes without saying that there's several uh, memorable quotes in this movie. But uh, moving right along, uh, pro number seven is the feeling of isolation. Mm. Which I think in some ways this movie kind of speaks to a certain audience, people who feel like they're maybe like the the outcasts of society, you know? Because like really me. if you think about it, the cast of this movie, the characters are pretty much, you're wondering what are they doing here? And you're thinking, well, maybe these guys really didn't fit in in society, especially Mac. And uh, the fact that they're all these kind of oddballs who are, and I guess not really forced, but they have volunteered to be in this situation together. Um, that might that explain just, something that I theorize about with Copper, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But no, uh, anyway, it's that feeling of isolation with the characters. I mean, they do have a rapport a little bit. Um but they still, they do kind of just go off to their own separate corners. Maybe a couple of them uh, are real close. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that Matt, ties into my he, theory too. He has some shack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that feeling of isolation just uh, helps the atmosphere of the movie all the more. Uh, and then going on into pro number eight. Uh, there's a bit of a commentary on trust and distrust going on. Uh, Which kind of makes... screams nowadays, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Are we talking like uh, related to COVID and whatnot? That and COVID, politics, religion. Oh, yeah. it's uh, In some ways, it's, it's funny. Social media has connected us in a lot of ways. <sighs> uh, well, for instance, I wouldn't be doing this... Uh, these reviews if it wasn't for Facebook and whatnot. But yeah. at the same time, it also, it also uh, highlights what's wrong with society. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm going to say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a nice sweet little line that uh, Mac has whenever he's talking to Blair, whether you're religious or not. It's a nice, it's a nice little sentiment. He says, you know, trust is a tough thing to come by these days. Maybe you should just trust in the Lord, you know, and I, that just, that just kind of endears, uh, Mac to the audience even more, I think. It also makes you feel bad for Blair. Yeah. Despite the fact he's giving him a total dope filled shit eating grin while he's saying that. Yeah. And like a dead, a dead, I guess deadpan stare whenever he says to watch Clark and watch him close to you. Hear me? You can kind of hear the morphine already starting to kick in. He's like, watch Clark. And you watch him close. You hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how cynical John Carpenter was by this point. I don't know. This might have actually been the beginning of his uh, shitty relationship with studios, considering this movie didn't do all that well. That's uh, thanks to E.T., um, yeah, um, I didn't really want to get into this, but I will, I will give brief mention to this. I, I don't want to get into it that much. I just will say this movie was massively critically panned upon its release. Some people called this one of the worst movies ever made to which I just think is ludicrous, but it did come out. Was it before or after E.T.? It came out the same summer. I don't know. I think it was after, but they were pretty much both in June 1982. E.T. and The Thing were very close. It, it, ironically, they're also uni both Universal movies. E.T. and The Thing were very close, closely released in 1982. And also the year after this, we would have Return of the Jedi. 
So at the time, everybody, when they wanted sci-fi, they wanted something uplifting and epic. They didn't want the brooding, depressing, gory alien invasion movie that is the thing. Um, so yeah, this movie was massively panned. It was pretty successful. It made $19 million against a shockingly $15 million budget. Like, wow. Wow. This movie only cost $15 million. Is that well, the- I think it's safe to say uh, two things. Uh, this movie was ahead of its time. Very. And it's also... Yeah, it's also not really blockbuster material. I mean, not everybody's going not everybody's going to like take their kids to go see this. It's 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 aimed at a very specific audience. Yeah, that's true. And now, of course, nowadays it's kind of been like The Shining. I still think Shining is a bad movie, but when The Shining was first released, it got really bad reviews. But later down the line, it was rediscovered and I guess everybody just decided that it's a classic. But Deservingly, with this film, in uh, years down the line, everybody rediscovered this film and everybody said, oh, this actually is a good movie. What the fuck were we saying back in 1982? Well, again, it's just the fact that some movies, some uh, people come up with a story and the way they execute it is just so beyond what people are comfortable with and what they're used to. That whenever it comes out, it's like, oh, this is like the worst thing ever. But then you give it time, and it eventually finds its audience. And I dare I say, there really isn't many people, you know, who have seen the movie and like it, who say anything bad about it. Except my wife. Well, and there again, you know, it's not it's not a movie for everybody. It's a movie for a very specific uh, audience. Well, she also likes the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie. Well, I do too, so I will be her, Fuck! her ally. In <laughs> it's uh, bad. Well, I mean, well, we might get into that whenever you do your superhero binge. But... Well, that's not going to be for a long time. Foreshadowing yeah. is obvious foreshadowing. Uh, so one more note on the commentary on trust and distrust. I don't know if this is whenever it started for Carp- Carpenter, but from this point on, he was definitely a guy who uh, didn't have a lot of faith in humanity. Yeah, so, he's kind of like if – oh, what the hell is that writer's name? Takashi Kimura, if he was a director. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he wrote uh, – a lot of the darker Toho movies. Yeah, he wrote or the Gargantuous and Matango. And Rodan, too, actually. Rodan and Matango being his two best scripts, in my opinion. Yep, yep. Uh, oh, and speaking of Matango, just a little uh, side note, it's a movie that's very similar to the thing. <laughs> <laughs> But, okay, so I'm just going to say my last two uh, real quick. Uh, number nine and ten. Uh, number nine is the feeling of paranoia. Oh, which yeah. Again, which, again, that really just builds off of the isolation and the suspense and the atmosphere. I mean, this is definitely a movie that uh, reminds you how easy it is for people to start to distrust one another and how quickly they uh, might turn on each other. Which Knowles says at the very beginning, um, well, no, it's not Knowles. It, I think it was actually Fuchs. When it's revealed that the Norwegian camp was only stationed there eight weeks, and I think it's Fuchs that says eight weeks isn't enough for somebody to go crazy. Bullshit. Everybody's different. When somebody feels like they're trapped... Some people take it better than others, but also some people can even go loopy within a day or two. For sure. And also and the kind of quote, to co- sorry, to kind of quote Nulls, says, bullshit, man. Look at Palma. He's been away since five minutes after staying here. <laughs> yep, yep, I was just about to say. Bullshit, Buana. 
That was Five it. Five minutes is enough to put a man down here. I mean, look at Palmer. He's he's been like that since the first day. <laughs> and then, he flips, then he flips him off with his cigar. Did you notice that his cigar was like where his middle finger should be? It was his lighter, but yeah, of course I noticed that. It's lighter. Yeah, I'm sorry. My copy isn't uh, super uh, HD or anything, so it always looked like a cigar or something to me. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, and what factors into the paranoia, the suspense, the isolation is that I think uh, John Carpenter, this might be, even though I like most of his stuff, this might be his peak in terms yeah. of uh, being the director. And uh, that direction is just, I'd say it's masterful. Yeah. And uh, so do you want me to wait? Because I don't think we have any cons. Do you want to just wait or just wait till we Let's get to wait. that point? Let's wait. Let's okay, wait. So go into your pros. All right. I have one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen pros. I think that's the highest amount of pros I've ever had for any film I've reviewed thus far. Mm -hmm. I'd have to really go through my list and figure it out, but I think for the moment I'm going to say this is the record amount. Pro number one is the cast. We already talked about the cast, but I just want to say this is one of the most meticulously planned. Um, greatest horror movie cast I have ever seen in my life. The cast is made up of pretty much a bunch of nobodies except for Keith David, Wilford Brimley, and Kurt Russell. I have never seen any of these other characters in any other movie uh, that I've ever seen. Um, who's Busey? Oh, yeah, Joe Poles. Um, everybody has their moment to shine. Everybody has their quirks. Everybody has their personality. And um, what I love about this film, and this isn't in movies anymore, is there's a, it's a small scene that establishes everybody's personality, quirks, and just what kind of person they are in just showing how they, how they talk and how they interact with people. This isn't done anymore. This is straight up not done anymore in in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, I, I miss it too. Like, it does feel a little bit reminiscent of Aliens, even though Aliens came out four years later. But that's another thing that Aliens did is that it establishes their their personality and their quirks in just a, a, a small scene. Um, in here, they do the exact same thing, and it's so masterfully planned. I really have to wonder, was there just some kind of great chemistry going on on set or was Carpenter really that meticulous with how this movie was planned? It's probably a mix of both, but I'm really not sure which one I think is more obvious. Well, I'll also put it this way. Uh, after I saw this movie, if I saw one of these actors pop up in something else, I said, oh, that's blah, blah, blah from The Thing. And, you know, some people made fun of me because they were like, well, you know, these guys have done other movies. And I'm like, well, I remember them from the th thing. So screw off. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the cast is fantastic. Every character has at least one line um, that they're known for uh, that they spat off in this movie. Trev just did a perfect Knowles imitation. Palmer has his, what he kind of can actually, no, I know exactly what, what, Honey, are you okay? Palmer has his, which is you gotta be fucking kidding. Um, he sounds like your usual stoner. Yeah, he definitely does come off as a, a typical stoner. Um, McCready has quite a few. Blair has quite a few. Gary has the couch line. Everybody has their moment to shine when it comes to quotes. Um, overall, the cast is great, and I I, I uh, can't give them enough praise. Pro number two is the music. Um, 
Damn. The music was composed by, re again, recently deceased Italian music composer Ennio Morricone, which I, again, I learned that a couple of years ago, and when I found that out, I was like, oh, really? An Italian did this movie's music? Sweet. Yeah, my, you are my, such my, a my hater. Where are you going? Whatever. All right. Okay. Um, I I love... still Is it still warm? <laughs> I love you. All right. Sorry. So anyway, yeah. Ennio Morricone, who recently passed away, I think, was it this year or was it in 2019? Uh, it was this year, and I was just about to say that my other favorite score of his is from Wolf with Jack Nicholson. That's also a very good, creepy, atmospheric score. He did that movie, too? He did. He also scored the movie Orca. Anybody who calls that a Jaws ripoff is an idiot. It's not. Um, How do you feel about that? I like Orca. It. I actually think in some ways it's scarier than Jaws because it's more shocking. But anyway. Yeah, I can, I've always liked it. But anyway, go on. So yeah, the score, um, this is one of my all-time favorite musical scores ever. The the Thing theme. Dun. Dun, dun. Dun, dun. I love it. It's so creepy and it's so atmospheric and it sets the tone for this film so well. Nobody could have scored this movie other than Ennio Morricone. Carpenter is a good music composer and if he tried to score this film, he would have put out a good score, but I just don't think it would have fit this film nearly as well as anybody else. So... Um, yeah, Ennio Morricone, I honestly do believe this is his best music score for any movie that he ever did. Um, Wolf was all right. Orca's a good score. His music for the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly trilogy is really good. But this is when Ennio Morricone yeah. reached his peak, in my opinion. Um, what were you going to say, Trev? Oh, no, I was just saying, yep, yep, I agree. Um, oop. Okay, so no, I have 12. <laughs> I have 12 pros because I put down one of them twice. But the next pro I was going to say is the scares. I wouldn't know. There's a couple jump scares, but this I think is definitely the definition of body horror. David Cronenberg is famous for doing body horror. And I will say that if anybody else was to direct this film, it definitely would be David Cronenberg. I think he's similar enough to John Carpenter to make this movie as meticulously planned as it is. But damn, this movie is the definition of body horror, in my opinion. And a lot of this movie's scares comes from the body horror. All these grotesque monsters that you you see, like you never really see a definitive version of the thing, which is one difference that well, I'll talk about that when I get to the monster. But this movie does have one major difference with the monster from the book. Um, but this movie has some fantastic scares. It's all in the atmosphere and the feeling of isolation and the paranoia. And then you have all these crazy monsters running around. Uh, it's some scary shit. And there's a couple moments in this movie that do kind of get under my skin, no pun intended, uh, where I feel like I'm being watched. Actually, even last night when the movie was over, I was kind of feeling a little bit spooked out. I'm 23 years old, and the last movie to really get under my skin and scare me was the original Paranormal Activity, and I watched that when I was 19. Haven't watched a scary movie in four years, but a movie from almost 40 years ago is able to scare me. A little bit, at least. Props to you, man. That's lasting power. Yep. So, yeah, this movie's got good scares. 
Pro number four is the tension. Okay. The tension, the atmosphere, and the sense of paranoia, I feel, can all be wrapped up into this. Okay. One of the biggest reasons why I am so picky with things that scare me and things that I like in horror movies is because, like, everybody says that the biggest reason why the original Halloween is so scary is because it's full of atmosphere. No. Well, I also don't find slasher villains scary because th there's just the part of me saying, why don't you just fight back? Grab a weapon and fight back. But um, pure atmosphere in a horror movie is not enough to scare me. The, and Halloween is nothing but atmosphere. You got to have a little something to have that atmosphere go with it, which is why I only say atmosphere should be used in a horror movie as a supplement, not as like the basket that you put all of your eggs in. If you try to put all your eggs in an atmosphere basket, for me, it just does not work. It does not work at all. No matter how hard you try, it doesn't work. It works in the original Exorcist as well because not only does that film have atmosphere, it's also got shocking moments to make the atmosphere that much more intense. This movie is kind of similar. There's, It's a perfect mix of tension, paranoia, atmosphere, and gore. And this all comes together to make the perfect soup cesspool of fear. And this movie definitely does have that. Um, it's really all I have to say about it. This movie has excellent atmosphere. It's, it's the best utilization of atmosphere as a supplement. And that's why I do think this is the perfect. This is another reason why this is my favorite horror movie of all time. It balances all of horror elements perfectly. Shock, gore, suspense, and atmosphere. And also the suspense is great too. But this goes along with the tension as well. I think it reaches its peak with the testing scene. There's no music. All you hear is the sound of the flamethrower going. And uh, when McCready dips in the hot needle, you hear the sizzle. Okay, one down. But we don't know for sure yet. Next one, two down. Still don't know for sure. And I love Kurt Russell's acting here. I think it's the third one that he tests where you can see doubt on his face. He's like, yep, is yep. this working? And then just when you think you don't even know if it's going to work or not, the thing screeches out and Palmer is exposed. You're like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. And that's, a, that's an excellent jump scare because it's one of those jump scares that you really do not expect. It lulls you into thinking that nothing is going to happen and then something happens. Those are the perfect type of well-earned jump scares. And But then it doesn't even end because then you see uh, Palmer morph into this split head jaw type thing that's going around tearing windows apart. Um, it's fucked. But it's also awesome. That thing what? I said, I wish people would talk more about the Palmer thing. It seems like the Norris thing and the Blair thing get most of the attention, but I really like the Palmer thing. Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, the tension and scares in this movie are just perfect. It's perfect balance. Pro number five is the great production values. I just want to say that this movie, the, the the base looks great. I love it when horror movies, or films in general, but specific, especially horror movies, with their main sets that you spend a lot of time with, they convey a sense of actually being lived in. It doesn't feel made for the movie. It doesn't feel artificially made to look lived in. Like... I wouldn't be surprised if for a majority of this shoot, the cast and crew actually did live there. 
to get this movie made. There was some scenes that were shot in L.A., but a lot of this movie actually was shot in the wind and snow and winter. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually did live in this base for a while. And I love that. It definitely does convey a sense of the base being lived in. And it doesn't feel artificial or, like I said, just made for the movie. It feels real, if that it, it, uh, long long short of it. Um, yeah, the production values look great. The set looks great. Um, not much else to say. Have you seen the uh, Terror Take Shape documentary? No. It, it should be on uh, any of the releases, DVD or Blu-ray. It, I think they go into what you just suggested, the fact that they did uh, spend a lot of time on these sets. Pro number, what was this? One, two, three, four, six is the pacing of the film. Not going to really say anything much about this other than this is one of the greatest examples of cinematic pacing that I've ever seen in my life. No scene drags. No scene is too quick. Everything feels perfect. It, it, it moves. It's slow when it needs to be, and it's quick and chaotic when it needs to be. Uh, it's perfectly paced. I, I can't watch this movie like just from scene to scene. Whenever I start it, I just have to watch it all the way through. Um, and I'm never bored, and I'm never just like watching, looking at my watch or fidgeting in my seat. I'm just the entire time. Captivated. Love it. Captivated. Yes, thank you. Pro number seven, I believe. Yeah, for number seven. Oh, is the special effects. Holy shit. Okay, I'm just going to go on a limb. These are the greatest practical special effects I have ever seen in my life, in my opinion. The fly comes close. The fly, too, comes even closer. The blob comes even closer than that. But damn, I think these are the greatest practical special effects ever put on screen, bar none. Like, damn. Rob Bottin actually admitted himself into the hospital at one point, and Stan Winston had to take over for a little bit because uh, he was suffering from extreme exhaustion. So, to again, to quote Deus Deacon... Um, yeah, that's why the effects look so good. A guy nearly killed himself trying to make them look good. Yeah, uh, Stan is credited with uh, the part of the kennel scene wherever the thing is starting to look like a dog whenever all the men discover it. That's that's the part of the scene that he, he worked on. And he only gets a special thanks per his request in the end credits. Hmm. Um. Give us a list of a couple of your favorite effect shots in the film. I'll be right back. I actually have these bathrooms. So I'll be right back. Yeah, so uh, probably number one, because of how convincing it is, is whenever the Norris thing, whenever its head is splitting off and trying to uh, get away. Again, up until it grows its legs, uh, it looks like uh, the actor's actual head. Uh, probably after that, uh, would be the Blair monster. Well, actually not the Blair monster, the Blair thing. Uh, probably the, the kennel scene would probably be the one after that. Such a, such a chaotic evolution from one point to the next. Uh, yeah. And also this is something that I didn't, uh, mention, uh, during my pro for the special effects is that whenever, the kennel thing crawls up into the corner of the kennel and uh, is trying to get away from the man. Whenever it splits open and that uh, Venus flytrap looking thing comes out, it's actually supposed to be uh, all the different tongues of the dogs stitched together and used in a way that uh, is different to the things I've been. Whoa. Whew. Damn. You back, you back, Nick? Yeah, I'm back. 
Oh, I was just telling everybody, did you know in the kennel scene, uh, whenever the Venus flytrap thing comes out, uh, that is supposed to be all a bunch of different uh, dog tongues? Hmm. No, I did not know that. Yeah, I think that was in the commentary, one of, one of the special features. But yeah, anyway, so I was, I was telling them that uh, number one would be the Norris thing because how the head is so convincing that right before it uh, – grows its spider legs and then i was saying that the kennel scene the kennel dog the kennel dog thing is probably my second favorite and then there'd be palmer which you know that's a simpler uh transformation of it but it's still a pretty pretty Nasty. neat creature i think uh and i really like the blair monster but it actually isn't seen for a whole lot no unfortunately so I also wanted the stop motion to be included because you see a lot more of it. Um, my favorite effect shot in this film. Well, I do want to talk about the Norris thing because they. I realized I rewatched Deus Deacon's review um, of this movie, and he mentioned that the Norris thing really works because it actually makes the uncanny valley aspect about it work. It's obviously yeah, exactly. it it's obviously human, but it's also obviously not human, and that's what makes it creepy due to limitations in the special effects. Um and I, I, I agree, he's absolutely right, and I think that's another reason why this movie is uh, feels so timeless. Um yeah, I agree. But probably my favorite effect in this movie. Mm. Honestly, at least in terms of looks, probably is the Blair monster. Um, I just think it's a shame that um, there's not really that much of it seen. Um, and you can tell that it's a big, giant animatronic because it doesn't move around all that much. But it still looks great, yeah. and it's a great final monster. It's just kind of a shame that McCready couldn't really have an extended battle with it, like try shooting it apart and then blowing it up, but whatever. Um yeah, it's, def it's definitely the final boss, and it's also really, uh, I'd probably go out on a limb here, Blair is probably the smartest guy in the camp, so he, the thing basically imitated like the, the perfect person for like a final form. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, my, fa my favorite single effect shot in the film, I think, is when Norris's chest opens up and in goes Norris's arms. Because I'm pretty sure that was both the actual actor who played Norris and an effect shot. Like, it, it was a composite shot. I could be wrong, uh -huh. but I'm pretty sure that was a, a composite shot, and it's seamless. Absolutely seamless. Indeed. Uh, but yeah, these special effects are fucking phenomenal. In terms of the other special effects, there is some composite shots and there's a little bit of stop motion. The composite shots are mainly saved for when they discover the ship. Like almost all of that is a composite shot. And you can clearly tell that they're composite shots, but they don't look bad. The only one is when Norris and Mac are walking towards the the broken hatch when they're actually standing on the ship. That one's definitely the most easily noticeable as to how much of a composite shot it is, but I still think it looks all right. Um, they're matte painting. Actually. Or that, yeah, there's that too. And also, yeah, that there is a little bit of stop motion used on the Blair monster. Really? I think the, where it's really noticeable that it's a, um, stop motion effect is when the Blair monster shoots out of the, uh, shoots out of the floor, like a graboid, uh, like right after it, it swoops down the detonator. And also when it rushes towards, um, McCready at the very end, like when he flicks the lighter Creek boom! It looks like a graboid going underneath Chang's market in the first Tremors movie. That's probably why I like Tremors and the Thing so much around the same time. Eight years apart, but whatever. Um, so yeah, the special effects in this film are fucking phenomenal. 
Uh, Rob Botine was at the top of his game. Uh, practical aspect, practical special effects reached its utmost peak with this film. Not to say that there's any other movie after this where they're bad, where they are really, really good, but I just don't think anything has come quite to the level of the thing. There's been some really close ones, but still no mustard. Next is The Thing Itself. Of all the monsters in fictional media that ever existed, this is definitely one creature that I just would not want to tangle with whatsoever at all. I would rather go up against a horde of xenomorphs, because at least those could be killed, than go up against this thing. Um, I love this monster. This is one of my favorite monsters of all time, um, which is ironic because in this movie, it doesn't have a full form, yet it's easily recognizable as this amorphous, shape-shifting, hostile monster parasite thing. In the book, however, this is one difference that this film has to the story is that um, I want to talk about the differences a little bit, too. Um, there are a few. They're kind of minor, but they still do have to, well, obviously they have to do with the monster. Um, first off, it's theorized in the movie that the, the thing crashed to Earth uh, about 100,000 years ago. Whereas in the book, it said that it crashed to Earth 20 million years ago. Still not a huge difference. 100,000 years is a long time as well, but it's not that much of a big deal. Um, there's a lot more characters in the book. There's 37 characters in the original book, whereas here there's only 12. Which is probably... Now, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, what's another one? Oh, yeah, when it comes to the monster, there's two big differences. One is that in the book, the alien does have a true form. It's, it's stated to be about four feet tall, with blue skin, three red eyes, and long worm-like hair. They describe it as being like looking like worms. Um, and another big difference is that in the book, the monster is also telepathic. Which even goes further to add to the effects of paranoia and distrust. However, I kind of feel... I don't really know why that was dropped, but I feel like it may have just made this movie a little too overly complicated. So I kind of have mixed opinions because you can't make that work in this movie, but whatever. It, the movie still works without it. I just kind of have to question why was it dropped. But... Th there are actually... There are actually uh, like collectible busts and figures out there which take that design from the story but they give it like the fleshy orange red color of the things in this movie. And they, I think they named these kits, uh, these model kits. They're like supposed to be the thing in its purest form. And hmm. I also, I also wanted to clarify uh, what I meant before was, is that yes, uh, trimmers and the thing were eight years apart. But what I was saying was is that I was into both at the same time, because as Nick said, the Thing is a very unique monster, and Graboids are also a very unique monster. So I was basically interested in those two around the same period. Um, hang on. Yeah, overall, this monster is awesome. Um, it's definitely, one. I think, one of the most dangerous monsters ever showcased in, in, in fictional media because it's almost impossible to kill this thing short of dropping it into a giant vat of acid or dropping it into a volcano. Because no matter how much you burn it, if there's still some unburnt parts left, there's still cellular activity on this thing, and it's still alive, quote-unquote. Though I do want to talk about the question of can a single cell infect you. We'll get to that a little later. But this monster is fucking awesome. And uh, 
could not have asked for a, a better way to showcase how it's described as in the story than in, in this film. This leads me to my next pro. This is an excellent adaptation of the story. Um, it, Like I said, it's almost 90% accurate to the story. Like I said, there's a couple things that are changed around. Some numbers are changed. There's a couple scenes shuffled around. But I have to say this is one of the greatest adaptations of a book that, that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it's Nobody really talks about that aspect in my, in, uh, from what I've seen. They just say it's a great adaptation of the story, but I've never heard anybody like – when they talk about a list of the greatest book-to-movie adaptations ever made, you never hear anybody talk about The Thing. I think The Thing is one of the top ten greatest book-to-movie adaptations ever. Um, next pro is – Pro number 10, uh, there's some great kills. Um, not much to say other than a lot of people die in this movie in very horrible ways. Windows gets his head chomped on. Um, the Palmer thing gets blown the fuck up by a piece of dynamite, which Kurt Russell's reaction to that explosion was genuine. He wasn't expecting it to be that big. Um, a lot of people are set ablaze, uh, which being set ablaze, the flamethrower's got to fucking suck. Um, Bennings is wrapped in tentacles and constricted and stabbed and prodded. Um, Gary gets his face like impaled with Blair's hands and torn off and absorbed. Um, people die in some pretty horrible ways in this film. And, uh, it, it's, it's gruesome as fuck, but it's, it's also entertaining. I will say, I will say that the one scene that actually gets under my skin, because you know I've seen this so many times, the atmosphere is still, it still gets to me, but not to a point where I'm like super disturbed. But there is one moment related to kills. It's after Windows gets chomped a bit, and you know McCready uh, blows up the Palmer thing, and he comes back in, and Windows is sitting there in the corner, and he's making these. Oh, noises like he's you know slowly being assimilated mm -hmm. and that always did kind of get under my skin yeah uh, agreed um pro number 11 is the ambiguous nature of the entire story of this movie a lot of people love the film inception because it's one of those movies where when you watch it, how the story plays out is up to your interpretation. I already talked about this with Phantasm. Like the ending, does the top fall over or does it stay up? Is the ending a dream or is it not a dream? This is another one of those movies uh, where you watch the movie and it's your own interpretation. You can take it at face value and just watch the movie from beginning to end and you just say – how the movie's events played out is how the story plays out. Or you could take it as the thing comes to Earth, the dog pops up, assimilated somebody else, and um, they're both human at the very end when the thing goes on a rampage throughout the camp. There's Like, like Trevor said, there's a whole bunch of crazy-ass wild fan theories out there about this movie. People have literally written entire essays about specific scenes in this movie. Like, who sabotaged the blood? Who, who was infected when? And, of course, the ending. Um, there's so much about this movie that is ambiguous, but it doesn't feel like it was intent... Well... It doesn't feel like it was maliciously left ambiguous. It was left ambiguous because the director wanted to say, you make up your own interpretation and like it, it's fun to discuss your own interpretation with this film. Uh, it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like what's the it comes at night, which the director did go on record of saying that he intentionally made it incomplete just so people could come up with things with their own imagination. He Carpenter doesn't intentionally leave things blank for your own imagination to fill in. Like I said, you can take this film at face value, 
But if you look even deeper, there still are things that you can fill in with your own mind. And that's perfectly fine. Same thing with Inception. You could take that movie for its face value, or you could look deeper and come up with your own theory as to how the movie played out. And there, that's fine too. I don't like the film Inception. I don't like Christopher Nolan, but I do like that about Inception is that it's up to your own interpretation and it's done in a good way. Again, it's not like it comes at night where it, the director was just an asshole. Um, so yeah, I love the ambiguous nature of this movie. I love discussing like how this played out and how this played out and how these events happened uh, with other fans of this movie. It's fun and it, it creates great discussion which is what great films should do. And the final pro, pro number 12, um, is the ending. I love this film's ending because, like I said, you can either take it at face value and say either one's a thing or none of them are a thing. Or, like I said, you can make up with your own interpretation. You can come up with your own explanation, which many people have done, including Trev and I, in just a moment. So, I love this film's ending. Absolutely. I think it's one of the greatest endings in absolute horror film history of all time. Love it. Before we get to that, though, have any cons? No, I do not. There is a minor nitpick, but it has something to do with the questions we're going to go over, so I'm going to save it. I have really no major cons for this movie. I love it. I got none either. Um, I think this is a, a, a perfect film in any sense of the word. I do have a couple nitpicks. I will say, like, what the fuck... How are these guys doing down here? Are they doing some kind of project, or are they living down here? Um, God damn, that's the third time you've scared the shit out of me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, no, that's really the only nitpick that I have now that I think about it. It's like, what the fuck? Um, what the fuck are these guys doing down here? Um, so, yeah, I was inspired. I'm going to jump into this right now. One reason why I'm doing this review now is because I was inspired by Josh over at Movie Timelines. He did a video a couple weeks ago called 13 Unanswered Questions About John Carpenter's The Thing. I watched that video. I've watched it 10 times since it's come out. It's one of my favorite videos that come out on YouTube in the last few weeks. I love it. And that's what directly inspired me to do this review. I am not going to try to come off like I'm just ripping him off and copying his shtick. But there were some questions that I also want to give my own interpretation on in this video. Trev does as well. I shared him that video and he watched it. So he has 13 questions. I have five questions that I want to answer. Or no, excuse me. I have one, two. I have seven questions. Excuse me. Seven questions that I want to answer. Hmm. Question number one, whose shadow is that at the very beginning? When the dog thing goes to infect that one person, who is it? In actuality, it was really nobody in the movie because they had a unseen crew member come in to play the shadow to give a sense of ambiguity. Now, it was apparently supposed to originally be Palmer – but they thought that his shadow would be a little too distinctive. So my answer is I believe it is Norris because the guy looks a little thick in the chest and his hair looks a little more wild than Child's. Or not Child's. Um, like some people try to say that it was Child's, but the shadow had hair. Child's ain't got hair. Um, then Palmer, excuse me. But I think I do think it was Norris. And I think... Aside from the dog thing, Norris is the only um, thing to be active for quite a while in the film. What about you, Trev? Yes, I agree. I've heard for years that people debate whether it's uh, Palmer or Norris. 
it's usually those two. I don't really get the child's thing because, no offense, that shadow doesn't look like a black man. I'm sorry. But well, um, it has hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hair. Uh, the profile just always reminded me of Norris. And also you can tell that the individual is wearing a sweater. Uh-huh. And Norris wears a sweater, a blue sweater. It's actually, I think it's uh, the same kind of sweater that uh, Pamela Voorhees wears in uh, Friday the 13th. It is. <laughs> now that I think about it. Yeah, it, it's just very obvious to me that the shadow is horses. And also, uh, like Nick just said, it, it's clear if you're really paying attention that uh, Norris is a thing for a good portion of the movie because there's uh, certain times where his behavior is a bit suspicious. The one, the one that uh, sticks out to me is uh, whenever they find out what happened to the blood, and there's this distrust going on, whether it was Copper or Gary who had something to do with it, since they have access to the keys that can access the blood. Um, and anyway, Gary steps down eventually, and he offers up the leading position to Norris. And Norris says, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not up to it. Yeah, and the look and on his face about- is like, he, it just goes normal that goes, Norris, I can't see any, anybody objecting to you. I'm sorry, fellows. I'm just not up to it. It comes off not nearly as much somebody who's just handed power and they're turning it down because they don't know what to do with it. It's come. It comes off as somebody who doesn't know how to handle power, if that makes any sense at all. It just doesn't come off human to me, yeah, if that makes any sense. Again, if that makes any sense. I need to stop saying that. Seriously. <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's probably a little bit of both, to be honest. I think it's the fact that if you're the leader, you're the most highly suspect person in the group. True. And it also, like what Nick said, the fact that the thing doesn't really know how to lead a group of human beings. Yep. Next question is, when was Palmer infected? It was not any time before they all went out to go see the ship. Now, that this, the third person there is confirmed to be Palmer. And at that point, I, don't, I also don't believe that Palmer was a thing because it was just Norris and Palmer and McCready. If both of those two were things, they would have attacked McCready because they established that the creature needs to be alone with somebody in order to attack them there's two things there max outnumbered so i don't think that was the case of uh palmer being a thing at that point i believe that the thing or that palmer do did become a thing either when bennings was assimilated or sometime during the blackout That's just my own take on it. I actually more lean towards the blackout because I feel like that's just the most convenient and perfect opportunity for the monster to go on a a rampage. So that's my own take on it. How about you, Trev? Yeah. uh, I always used to think it was sometime during the blackout, and it probably still was. But uh, Josh also brought up in his video that it's possible that it happened before then. Uh, what was the point again that he said? Um, he just said it. Like that was the perfect opportunity because Bennings was being assimilated by the Hellraiser thing. So that was a perfect yeah. distraction for Norris to act because Norris is not seen until after the Bennings thing is, is torched. Yes, exactly. So I'm actually okay with either one of those uh, options. I've always leaned towards the blackout uh, time period. And that's also, uh, well, hold on. I think that's one of your questions, so I'll just save it. Yeah, the next question is, when was Blair infected? I also believe that was when uh, Blair was infected, was during the blackout. No, more specifically, now I also think that's how Fuchs died, because Fuchs saw one of the things go off to try to infect the Blair. And because there was a storm going on, it got lost a little ways. And 
Blair, or not Blair, uh, Fuchs either was trying to burn it or it got to him and he burned himself before he could be fully assimilated. When they discover Blair eating the food and having the noose tied next to him, I believe that at this point Blair is a thing. He's a fresh thing. The reason why he's eating is because he's trying to get himself some sustenance because he had just transformed. Um, he has the coat on because he's trying to get warm. He's saying, I want to come back inside because he's brand new. He wants to get information from the other two things or one, I think at this case, um, to try to figure out a plan. And also this jumped out to me last night. Um, when McCready says, have you seen Fuchs? Blair says, it ain't Fuchs. And they goes, it ain't Fuchs. I believe that was the Blair thing tripping over his own words and he, because he was newly transformed. And that was uh, another sign of him showing that he's a thing at this point. And also him saying, I want to come back inside. I want to come back inside. That's just him just trying to come back inside and not be isolated. Which was the opposite of what he was trying to do anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Also, there's one point along these lines. Uh, there's been a fan theory out there for a long time that suggests that Fuchs might have committed suicide because after he finds uh, McCready's shredded uh, uniform, or not uniform, was it his long? It was his underwear or something, wasn't it? It, it was like long johns, I guess. Long johns. Yeah, anyway, it's it's clear earlier on in the movie that uh, Fuchs places a lot of trust in Mac because he pulls him aside to tell him his concerns. So the theory is, is that whenever Fuchs was convinced, thanks to those shredded long johns, that McCready was a thing, he basically said, fuck this, and took himself out of the game. Um, I mean, it kind of holds water, but... Uh... It's one of those things we're not sure about. Yeah, we're just not sure about. We probably never will actually know what happened to a uh, parcel part of my wife. She's making food. Probably will never figure out exactly the answer to this que to that question, like what happened to Fuchs. That's why I didn't bring it up. Oh, but then this question we'll probably never will know, though I we can just give our theory. Who sabotaged the blood? I think it was Palmer. I think at this point was when Palmer became infected. And I feel like it may have been his idea because Palmer was the more rowdy of the two at that point so it definitely kind of seems like it would be more his mo to to try to sabotage the people whereas norris he was a thing but he was a little bit more timid as well um whereas palmer was a little more outgoing so i definitely think that it was palmer who sabotaged the blood and he didn't even need the he didn't even need the keys because he could just shape shift it himself to do whatever to the blood. Like, like grow a tendril with a knife and then another tendril with an eye so that he can look around and slice open all the bags. Yep. Yep. So that's my own, my own take on that. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, the evidence that Josh provided in his video convinced me. Can a single cell infect you? Josh convinced me of this myself. I honestly think not a single cell, like one cell of the thing. I don't think that's enough to take you over, but I do believe because cells are tiny, it can take a very small sample, like literally one or two drops of blood could be enough to, and I specifically say blood. I don't say saliva. Because there's two pieces of evidence to me that points out that saliva is not how the thing transfers itself. It's blood. Because one, the dog licks Benning's, Benning's face and Benning's doesn't become a, a thing until the Hellraiser thing thaws out and attacks him. Licks his face a whole bunch of times. 
But also, two, when Norris is having his heart attack, Windows assists Copper in like getting him on the table and, and trying to prep him to be uh, resuscitated. He pries open his mouth, and his hands are inside of his mouth. Obviously, there's going to be saliva in there. And Windows never becomes a thing until he gets his head chomped off. So I specifically think it was blood that, that can take over an, an, an entire organism. It can be literally just like you can prick your hand and just shake in a drop. That, that would be enough. A very small sample of the thing's DNA could be enough to take somebody over, but not one single organ, not one single cell. I think that's a little too small. Trev? So, yeah, this factors into my one minor nitpick with the movie, and I don't know whether this is a fault on anybody who was making the movie or just a faulty uh, interpretation from audience members. But really, it doesn't make sense for the thing to behave like a virus. Because for one, th for one thing, viruses aren't living things. They're, they're things that affect living things, but they don't have any consciousness of their own. The thing is supposed to be a life form that kills you, and while it's absorbing you, copies and replaces your cells with its own, and then it imitates you. So it's not, it's not really... It's not a virus, it's a parasite. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's a parasite. It's not infecting in a viral sense. It's it, it take it actually takes you over. If you had a virus, uh, you know, you wouldn't know about it until you like got uh, test results. Mm -hmm. And uh, what factors into this nitpick is the fact that it's not known unless you look into it that Norris actually is supposed to have a heart condition uh, beforehand. So. And when the thing imitates him, it inherits that heart condition. Mm -hmm. So I've seen interpretations out there that say that he feels a thing crawling inside him. And I'm like, well, that's a bad hot take because he is the thing. So uh -huh. he wouldn't feel it crawling around inside of him. That's just the, the heart condition that the thing has inherited. And I so do yeah, know what triggered the Norris thing to attack it was the first defibrillation. Now, for those of you who don't know, I just want to say, a defibrillator is, an, is a machine that doctors use to administer electric shocks to somebody having a heart attack or heart failure to restart the heart pumping. And also when they say, when somebody is about to um, administer the paddles, they say clear. That means get your hand off the body. Because those uh, paddles... Those paddles administer electric shocks strong enough, like 500 volts or so. That's still enough to literally knock you on your ass, and it's going to hurt. So I believe that once that the thing felt – because uh, Norris zaps him once – or not Norris. Uh, Copper zaps Norris once, and then it feels that, obviously. And then when uh, he says clear, boom, opens up the mouth. That was its defense mechanism to not being shocked again. Um, next question. This one's a little humorous. Where are Copper's pants? When the when McCready discovers, or not McCready, when when Clark and McCready discover the dog thing. An alarm is triggered, and Doc Copper comes out wearing shirt, shoes, and socks, but no pants. Why? Josh had no answer for it. I don't know if Trevor has an answer for it, but I have a potential answer that's a little humorous. I think Copper was getting blown. Yeah, I think that Copper was was getting head. Um, because this is my own interpretation of this. Copper comes off as a little gay. Like when he's... And you might ask who is blowing him. I think it was Bennings. 
because when after Bennings gets shot, get your stool and use that. I'm too short, even with my stool. I still can't read shit. Uh, when after Bennings gets shot, just the way that Copper's talking to him, oh, come on. It's four stitches, barely grazed you. It just comes off really gay. Like, there's something between those two. That's just my own take. And, okay, yeah, I, I have... Never, what? No, and I never really thought about it until uh, this video pointed out, and then Nick uh, provided his theory. But And I don't think this really has anything to do with it, but he also does have a nose ring, too. So That, too. Yeah. Which is a little odd, especially for 1982, where facial piercings on men wasn't really a common widespread thing. Whatever. He's an old man, too. Yeah, that's even stranger. So, the final question, this is the obvious one. Who is who at the very end? Now, I always just went along with the crowd and I said, McCready is a human, Childs is a thing. I do think now that is bullshit, and I do believe that both McCready and Childs are human at the very end. To me, there's five pieces of evidence to suggest this, and in my eyes, they prove it. One, Childs is completely clothed and also has a flamethrower. If it was a thing... I highly doubt that it would be going around camp trying to find a perfect set of clothes and a perfectly operational flamethrower just to disguise itself as Childs. And also, McCready's all by himself. Why didn't the Childs just attack him right then and there? Two, if you take into account, and you should, because technically the thing 2011 is, is canon to this film... Child still has an earring. Three, the Dark Horse comic sequel, The Thing from Another World, as it's called. That does confirm that Child survived and was a human at first. Later in the comics, he did become a thing, but at the beginning of that comic series, he is still human. Four, the Thing video game, which also is canon. Childs was discovered by the main characters of the video game, uh, and he was a human, and he died due to, the, due to the cold. And five, Carpenter said that the ending is obvious. Mac is a human, and Childs is a thing, because Childs doesn't breathe. Bullshit. Because A, Bennings was a thing, and when he was screeching, you can see his breath. But also, two... If you look carefully, it is a trick of the light because McCready is front lit because of the flames. You can clearly see his breath. And Carpenter was saying, uh, or no, Childs is backlit so you can't see his breath, quote unquote. Yes, you can. You can see Childs breath on a couple of occasions while he's speaking. So as far as I'm concerned... Both Childs and McCready are humans at the very end. Not to mention what Sean just said. Kurt Russell and Keith David are far too cool and badass to get infected. <laughs> so. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make any sense if you're trying to imitate something and blend in that your breath would not be seen. Because if you're imitating an organism that... Has working lungs, you would imitate that. Yeah, has working lungs. Yeah, you're, you're going you're gonna to breathe like they do. Also, uh, yeah, pretty much I've always... I've never really entertained the thought that one of them was a thing. I just thought that they were both still human and that they were probably just going to die there. Uh, but there is one interesting fan theory, completely pulled out of their ass, but still interesting, that uh, McCready actually has gasoline in his uh, bottle. I heard about that. And, 
Yeah, and the reason why uh, Mac is kind of uh, laughing a little bit is because whenever a child takes a drink, he has no reaction to it, which means that he's not human because he's not reacting to the gasoline in the bottle. First of all, there's no evidence to suggest that uh, Mac put any gasoline in his alcohol bottle. So, you know, that, again, that's something that just sounds like it was pulled out of somebody's ass. It's mm-hmm. interesting, but there's no evidence to support it. Now, also not to mention, they did use Molotov cocktails earlier in the film. They were all unlabeled wine bottles. Whereas that's the true. bottle that they passed at the end of the movie, it was clearly a scotch bottle. You could see the sticker on it. And also, too, mm-hmm. like imitating a healthy pair of lungs, you would also... Uh, imitate a human body's reaction to ingesting gasoline. You know what happens to you when you ingest gasoline? You suffer near instantaneous liver and kidney failure. It's like drinking uh, antifreeze. So really, really like the viral infection thing, that just seems like the audience not really completely understanding the premise of the movie or the details given. Yep. That's all I have. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say about the questions, the ending, and this movie. So let's go into our final thoughts and rating. God damn, is this a great film? Again, I don't like John Carpenter. I don't think he's that good of a film director. But damn, did he pull this movie off? And I will give him all the credit in the world. He gave me my all-time favorite horror film, and he also gave me one of my all-time favorite films in general, which is why I will, of course, be giving this movie a perfect, solid gold 10 out of 10. I cannot recommend this film enough. If you love 80s horror movies, you will dig the shit out of this film. Trev? I concur. I also give it a 10 out of 10. One of my favorite movies ever. Uh, I really need to make this list, but it would definitely be on my favorite horror films or sci-fi films, too. Uh, definitely. And yeah, it's it's an absolute masterpiece. I really enjoyed revisiting it. Well, look forward tomorrow as we're not quite done with this film's universe, as tomorrow we will be discussing the 2011 prequel 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 to this film also called the thing so look forward to that and as always go out and if you go to an outpost in antarctica arm yourself at all times with a flamethrower because you never know and i will see you guys in the next video